Good afternoon and welcome to Conversations with Father Bosco, a webinar series hosted by the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's conversation, Jesuit Values in Practice with Georgetown COO, Jeff Chattis. Our host, Father Mark Bosco, is Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University and holds an appointment in the Department of English. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Father Bosco joined Georgetown after 14 years at Loyola University, Chicago, where he was a tenured faculty member with a joint appointment in the Departments of Theology and English. From 2012 through 2017, he also served as director of the Joan and Bill Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage at Loyola. As a scholar, Father Bosco has focused much of his work on the intersection of theology and art, specifically the British and American Catholic literary tradition. He has published on a number of authors, including the writers Graham Greene and Flannery O'Connor and the theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. He is also co-producer and co-director of the film Flannery, which was awarded an NEH grant. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement in Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few reminders. This conversation is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel, and you will receive the recording link in our follow-up email. Father Bosco and Jeff will answer audience questions towards the end of their discussion. Please send in your questions using the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please also submit those concerns via the question section of your control panel. Without further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Father Mark Bosco. Thanks, and, and, and again, uh, speaking of technical difficulties, uh, Father Bosco was not <laughs> was not on his game today with uh, with this webinar with the webcam. So my apologies for starting a little late, but Jeff, it's so good to see you, uh, and so good uh, to be part of this conversation. As you know, Jeff, these conversations are really a, a, just about a way to get to know our our Georgetown community. Uh, we've done it with a lot of the Jesuits who have uh, taught here, and. Uh, we thought it would be really wonderful to have an opportunity to get to know you um, through a, a conversation about who you are as a Hoya, uh, a little bit of your, your background, and, and just how you see higher ed today, uh, especially as you move into this job. So I really appreciate, I think everybody knows who you are, uh, which is uh, in terms of, of your job here as the uh, COO of, of Georgetown. And this is your third year, if I'm correct. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. good. So let's just begin because uh, again, we're, we started out. I just want to ask you, when what, what was the years that you were here as an undergrad? And um, uh, I, I have to ask Jeff, what, who was? Did you take Problem of God? <laughs> who was that? And what was your freshman dorm? Because every alum can tell me those two things, no matter where I go in the world. Well, Father Mark, thank you for having me on. It's it's a delight to be here. It's fun to be on a Zoom that's not about COVID, returning students and faculty issues. So I greatly appreciate an hour of of uh, you know fun chat. I hope so. I'm a member of the class of 1985. I'm one of at least three of us that I know that working here today. Mary Prinsky, who's in the advancement office, and I, I'll say of course, but Patrick Ewing, our basketball coach, who's also um, a member of our class. I um, and it's funny because so I, I came to Georgetown in 1981. I'd never seen the place. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and in a family of rabid Michigan fans, uh, going to football games every every weekend at basketball games. And of course, I got here, and we were a basketball powerhouse. So I just thought it was a natural transition from Big Ten to it wasn't the Big East in those days, but to to another basketball powerhouse. Yeah, you know, you're you're the class that everybody thinks, well, isn't Georgetown always like this with the great basketball team? I was talking to people who came like four years later than you than you graduated in the early 90s. And they're like, yeah, we just always heard about that of those those four years before. Uh, but it was really a remarkable time to be part of Georgetown. Who was the president? then? that was Father um, uh, Father Healy, correct? Healy. Father Healy. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. Did you have a chance to get to know him at all um, when you were here? No. I didn't. Well, I got to meet him, but I got to know Bob Lawton very well. Bob was the the oh, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and he and I became quite good friends um, over the course of my my years here. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, there's probably at that time there were probably about a good forty Jesuits actually working on the campus, much less more Jesuits on on campus. So that's great. Um, so tell me a little bit. What do you see? You know. What was the what was the brand new building you might say when you were an undergrad? Because you know you are a man of buildings now, and so what was the new building? What was, what did the campus look like that you remember? 
all I know, the new building. So, you know, two of them. One um, was, uh, by the way, I, I lived in Harbin, as did Mary. Oh, good, 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 Harbin. Uh, and then I lived in Henley my sophomore year, which is where Patrick was living. So the love connectivity of the, the class. Now, the new, there were two new buildings. The first was the ICC. Mm. The Intercultural Center was, was, was new while we were here as students. And then what was then called Village B, I think we call it Alumni Square now, but a, a number of my friends live there. In fact, I celebrated my 22nd birthday, and you may not ask questions about that, uh, <laughs> in one of the units at, at, at uh, what I, Alumni Square. That's great. And what did you major in, Jeff? So I was a double major in history and economics. Oh. Uh, and in fact, my undergrad advisor was none other than Kathy Alesco, who is still here. She's still a professor in the history department. And um, when when Jack had asked me to meet Wayne Davis, who's the chair of the philosophy department, I think for a while. Uh, and during the course of that that discussion, I learned that Kathy was his wife and that she was still here. So now I work with her. So she's gone from mentor to colleague, which is just a great Georgetown thing. That's great. That's great. I want to talk a little bit about that coming home kind of experience, but um, you know. I, I've only been here four years. I feel like a graduating senior in some ways, Jeff. Uh, but um, it does seem that Georgetown has this amazing ability to create these deep bonds with friends and classmates. Um, can you name, can you call out some of the, the, the classmates that were your friends here that you still even came in contact with? And maybe even just tell some stories about what was life, what was life like hanging out with your friends uh, in the 80s? So I'll start with my freshman roommate. It was a guy named David Riccadio. He went to the Priory School. Mark oh, in St. Louis, Louis right? sure. from, from Kirkwood, and we we became fast friends freshman year, and um, and uh, when we I started thinking about studying abroad, so I was studying history and economics, and I really wanted to go to London where they study economic history, which we didn't do, but I thought sounded kind of interesting. So I I applied to and got into London School of Economics, and on the journey there, I convinced Dave he was going to be pre-med his dad was a doc and he was going to be pre-med and he got here and decided he really wanted to study english of all mm -hmm. things so i you know as his roommate and in many ways soulmate at that point convinced him to apply to go to the uk for the year and study english there which made sense to me right, right, um, right. so we got over there and i would say within two months of our arrival he was at the university of sussex i was in london so he was in brighton he met and fell in love with a fellow student, uh, a, a young Welsh woman who was a student there, and he decided halfway through the year to transfer <laughs> out oh from Georgetown. But he was the best man in my wedding. I am the best man in his wedding, uh, which was in Wales, and uh, and we've just been been dear friends for 35 years and very close. Um, and when I did my 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 sophomore year, I, I met a bunch of friends who were in the class of '86 and. Jeff Prince and Matt Peter, they all lived in Darnell when I was living in Henley. And um, Jeff was in my wedding as well. And um, in fact, he has a daughter, Sophie, as do I. And, um, you know, we went to the final four together in Lexington. Um, in what I still can't believe, because my dad was a kind of very conservative dad, I asked if he would rent a, a Winnebago for a group of us to drive <laughs> to Lexington to Kentucky. And I think 10 of us drove from DC to Lexington and Jeff was one of them. So just some some lifelong friendships. That's great, that's great. And I know I, these, these alumni uh, networks are just incredible class uh, um, class friendships. Um, you, it, it's very interesting to me that um, you studied abroad and did you do that sophomore or junior year then? Junior year. So yeah, yeah I was here freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, which of course the year we won. <laughs> we won the yeah. final four. I learned about it on a train in, in Germany in the International Herald Tribune. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. So that's cool. You know, I think one of the things, again, coming to this global university today, um, how important really um, studying abroad and being and having that. If you if you could just share a little bit, you know, what did you learn about yourself being away that year? And what did you learn about the world? And I mean, it, it, it's just it's such an important aspect of being a Hoya today. Yeah, so Georgetown sparked my international imagination the first two years here. I, as I said, I, for, for whatever reason, I'd never been to London. I was just desperate to study there, be a student. Um, and when I got there, I, I had one of those interesting kind of academic moments that you probably know better than I, but the professor I was working with asked if I was interested in, in doing some research for him, and then I co-sponsored a 
or co-wrote an article with him on economic history and the development of the middle class, which sounds kind of boring, but at the time it was really fascinating looking into English cities and how they developed. And so I developed this enthusiasm. I came back, I graduated, and then I began pretty much a nine year journey abroad. I went, I decided I wanted to do a master's degree in economic history. I applied to and got into Oxford. I studied there for three years. Uh, and after the second year, I knew I didn't want to be an academic, but I was fascinated with the academic world. And so I took a summer internship with a bank in Brussels and I, I that was my moment. Well, this is what I love. And so I worked in Brussels, finished my MPhil, and then I got my first job with Citibank in Zurich. So uh, and it was a fascinating, back to your point of what we learned as Hoyas, well, my job was helping the leaders of the bank decide where to expand in Eastern Europe. So I was traveling at the tender young age of, I think, 26 to meet foreign ministers in Russia and Poland and what was then Yugoslavia. And um, you learn about that importance of connectivity and relationships um, and, and, and Georgetown friends everywhere. And then I did my MBA in France outside of Paris, so lived there. Um, and then came back to work in New York for a couple of years. Thank God, it's where I met my wife. Um, and then we went back to London where we lived for, for, for quite a while and had a daughter. So, but every, all along the way, that connectivity, I interviewed for Georgetown, you know, for the yeah. alumni interview programs and every city I lived in and, and, and stayed in close contact with alums all over the, all over the world. Wow, that's great. Um, you have, you really, one of the things I, I really admire about you, Jeff, is that when we first met you, uh, you were in the application, when, when Jack was inviting you to come for the job, and even a, a couple of dinners we had, uh, you do have quite an intellectual and academic kind of um, hunger about you. You're, so I think that coming back to Georgetown was such a wonderful thing because you, as a COO, it's not just business. You have this kind of intellectual curiosity, uh, and especially with history. I know we've talked about that a lot. So um, I think it's really important to have, to understand that the university is, is and is not a business. And I think with your intellectual kind of background and capacities, that kind of makes a, a great a, a great fit. Um, I think, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, please. Well, just I was recalling freshman year, I took a course in colonial American history and it was in the Healy building looking out on the lawn. And you do have these moments of kind of, well, I hope everyone does this intellectual curiosity and learning something new and that sparks your imagination. And so I think that's been a real help for me in that experience in London where I learned about kind of what an academic friendship can look like was really important. Wow, fantastic. Um, you know, we don't want to talk too much about your huge job, but you have a huge job, uh, maybe even more so with this pandemic. And, um, but I'm, what are some of the, knowing you a little bit, but what are some of the gifts that uh, you think you, or you hope you bring to the job? Um, and maybe just to kind of follow through, why did you accept Jack's offer to come back and serve at Georgetown? So that's a that's a great question. I'll, I'll I'll start with that. Well, how did I even get into higher ed? Because as I told you, I wasn't. I was in the finance world and ended right. up being an executive at a very large uh, energy company. And then I started an infrastructure fund at J.P. Morgan. Um, and and you might say, well, how the heck did you get here? Uh, I had been teaching all along. One year, this this this. I'm not Catholic, by the way, but this Catholic connectivity in my life has been profound. <laughs> And I taught at Oxford and I really enjoyed it. And so when I was, became an executive at this, this energy company, um, I saw that Ohio Dominican University sure. uh, needed somebody to teach a corporate finance course at night to mature students. And so I, on Mondays, um, I would go teach from six to 10 just because I loved being in the classroom. I loved sharing knowledge and all that. And, and I then taught when we lived in Raleigh, North Carolina, I taught at Chapel Hill at the Keenan Flagler Business School. And I invented a course with another professor that was kind of marrying theory and practice in the business world. So what happens when the books are wrong and how do you change course when you have challenges? And then I replicated that at Ohio State when we moved back to Ohio when I was running the fund um, for JP Morgan. And I, I kept saying to myself, you know, that higher ed needs help. They need somebody who can understand the passion of the academics and the real world needs that it's not a business per se, but it needs to be run in many ways like a business. And so sure. the then president of Ohio State, Gordon Gee, I knew him quite well at that point. And I, the fund had just finished its run. And, he, and I was telling him, I was thinking about what's next. And he said, well, hey, uh, 
you keep saying higher ed's broken, come help fix it. So that was the journey. And I was there for about eight years and did a lot of interesting and innovative things. And Jack and I met at a um, conference in Aspen that we went to every year. Um, and I think eight years was kind of my limit at Ohio State being a Michigan guy and uh, and that I'd kind of done what I set out to do. And he asked if I would have any interest in coming home. And to my great surprise, I answered yes, almost immediately. Um, and then I flew down and spent a day with him and then met you all and uh, really realized this was a, a great next move. Yeah, it has been a great move. I mean, you uh, you have really done a, such an amazing job. Uh, obviously, you, you know, before COVID, you have really set the university on a great trajectory. Um, and I even know, speaking of dorms, all the dorm uh, improvements that were made over the spring and the summer and even the fall now, um, it's just fantastic uh, what, what's going on on a campus that needs to be closed down with, with all that construction. And um, so I, I, think, I think you've got a lot of people very, very pleased um, with, with what you're doing here. Um, you know, you mentioned the fact that you're not Catholic, but that you obviously came to a, a Catholic, in, the first Catholic and Jesuit university and you did well. Um, and, and those values, you know, they really do kind of sink in on so many different ways uh, with, with, with people and at different moments of their life. I was really uh, happy that you said yes to uh, a, a program called Ignatian Colleagues Program. Um, and just for our, our viewers, the Ignatian Colleagues Program is, is set up by the uh, Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities to really invite administrators into a deeper kind of, of uh, engagement and encounter with the Jesuit and Catholic heritage of higher education alongside other university um, administrators and, and faculty. Um, so that you're doing this kind of as a journey together. I, I, I was really so happy that uh, you were able to find the time to do it for, for one thing. Um, but uh, can you say, speak a little bit about that experience uh, to our group? Because I, I think it's really important that everyone knows that part of the inviting you here is to also invite invite you into this kind of commitment to this vision of, of, of Georgetown. Well, first of all, I owe you and Jack a profound debt of thanks for involving me asking me because it, it, it's been far more and i'm on the journey now so it's uh we're halfway through it kind of we hit a speed bump <laughs> with covid <laughs> it's caused us to have to change things a little bit but um you know i was i was laughing because in the first session the 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 my fellow participants were talking about the mass of the holy spirit and i had no idea what they're talking about <laughs> even though i was here for all those years so i had to go out and look it up and learn and, and 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 i've learned about the richness of the traditions and by the way you and i had a wonderful chance in rome together when we were there with yeah. other leaders for you to share with me such such a the rich history of what the jesuits have done and put it into context which helped a lot but this program uh, a couple of things you know and i kept texting you to thank you on the way the first was that we did a mini kind of silent retreat we didn't do a month but we did a week and we were up in the foothills of the front range in in denver um and i remember my wife and all my friends saying there is not a chance you are going to go a week without talking to us just just don't bother because you can't you come from a, a loud family and you like to talk well it was the opposite for me i found it incredible that I could just shut up for seven days and listen. And you start, as you know, because you do this every year, you start to hear and see things. And it was the start of winter and just, you'd walk out the door and there were a group of deer stopping, looking up at you and you st sort of have this kind of cosmic mm -hmm. connection with people yeah. and things without speaking. Um, and the one time we did speak every day was a, was a spiritual guidance session where we were allowed to, meet with somebody to kind of talk about the relevance of faith and if i recall i i and i by the way i did everything that i didn't bring books and i didn't bring devices i so that was the first experience where i left feeling incredibly calm and mm. then peace and curious wow. about a lot of questions i'd raised but also understanding this importance of reflection in what yeah. we all do every day which most of us it passes by because it's so quick and then the second was right before COVID hit, I had the chance to spend a week or 10 days in the Dominican Republic. Um, and it was incredible in the sense that it was challenging. I think I texted you one of the days and said, what did yeah. you get me into? Because we were, we were in an orphanage and um, these young children, it was a really, and compared to anything we all may be used to, was pretty horrific, but there was hope. 
And then, yeah. and then we went into Haiti, which was, so if you thought it was bad in the Dominican Republic, but, but I think the hard part for me is I'm a problem solver, as you know, and I like to think that I can control things and um, you can't always control everything, but what you can do is you can influence. And, you know, I, I called Lee Reed and I said, my God, these kids don't have soccer balls in this orphanage and that's what they do every day and within a week lee had had the whole men's and women's team brought a collection of balls together and sent them down to the orphanage and just to put a smile on a young person's face who is basically homeless um, yeah. is a step in the right direction so part of that journey is learning i think mark that you again you know this you can't control everything you can't right. change everything right. but you can make a difference yeah, that's a that's a great way of putting it. I've always thought in, in my own uh, life as a as, as a Jesuit, it's it's I it's it's like mastery versus mystery. Sometimes you just cannot master everything. You just have to live in the mystery of being human and being unable to do something or to do something from the side. So I think that's really I think it's really one of the things that Ignatian spirituality always asks of us to to always remember that you don't have to be the master of the universe. There really is a kind of something beyond your own mastery. Uh, and sometimes that's where we find God, and even in an orphanage, uh, and it, along with the, the accompaniment of others. I I know that part of the IC, the ICP the, uh, is also just getting to know other people. That you're not alone in this, right? There is a kind of a sense that you can share in that group in a way that you don't really share in the boardroom, or you don't share, share with your you know with your colleagues maybe around your your know, your table, right? So I think that's really a, a positive thing. It was really. Um super evident if those two experiences weren't enough when COVID hit because we did keep meeting every week and this was people there are people from schools that were having financial problems and schools in very different settings from you know LA to San Francisco to Maryland to Cleveland to Denver and, and it was a moment where you could just take a step back and to your point realized that although we all had different they weren't all coos there were right. academics and uh administrators and but you have a shared a shared pain we were going through shutting down universities right and learning how to take care of each other yeah. uh, i wouldn't normally have said but it's true it's just that 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 sense of community is really profound Wow, that's great. I remember before we kind of leave this, I, re I remember the Christmas party that you you hosted, and I ran into your wife, Katie, and and she, she says, "I don't know what that was about, but that was really good." Whatever Jeff went on, <laughs> so that was the last thing she said before Merry Christmas on the way out. So I just want to I want to let you know that. But I think um, she'd like me to go back again and <laughs> shut up for a week. <laughs> um, one of the things that I really I bonded with you, just in terms of hearing you talk is your real because you had run an energy company and energy efficiency and, and those things and we of course think obviously environmental sustainability and environmental justice is such a key thing here we've even added a value to our spirit of georgetown values you know care for our common home inspired in many ways by pope francis's own kind of call to the world to do that and i just you know that's just one among the many values that i that we're, we're all part of but I know. Can you speak a little bit about your 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 work and your sense of of why that's such an important aspect of what Georgetown does, much less you know the world. You know, I think taking a step back beyond beyond before what we're doing here, the 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 Jesuit experience as well helps us grow in an, in an ethical sense, if you will. I teach an ethics class, and it's often hard to teach because you're saying to young folks look in the mirror and ask yourself if it's the, if it's the right thing to do but a lot of the course you mentioned problem of god but a lot of the courses we took here and the experiences we had helped shape that notion of what is right and what may not be right and right's a difficult word and wrong but but it's important as you go through your career and I, yes i was the treasurer of the largest burner of coal in the western hemisphere on my journey um and again as i look at myself and say well what can we do well we were very early adapters to renewable energy almost to the point that people were laughing at us in the in the 90s as we were building wind uh, farms and wind turbines and looking at other sources of renewable energy and if you look today it's a different world and when i started the fund at jp morgan mary erdos who is a fellow hoya who's a senior executive um at jp morgan is uh, actually younger than i am was my boss at one point and i remember making a pitch to to mary and the rest of her team to start a climate change fund 
um, a long, this is in 2007. Yeah. And, and so obviously there's a, there's a question of how you, you, you emerge with these sort of values, if you will, but how you can use them in a way that can, can make sense in a business setting, but also doing the right thing. And I think, you know, when I got here, our, our commitment and the Pope's commitment to the environment and to sustainability and doing the right thing, I think is profoundly important. And one of the things Pope Francis said was, look, you can't buy your way um, by buying these renewable energy certificates to fulfilling your obligation. And I agreed, I had agreed with that before he said it, and I was delighted when he did say it. And, you know, just yesterday, I signed a 15 year agreement for solar power to meet two thirds of our need generated in Maryland and New Jersey, um, and it's saving us money. And so wow. you can do both and you can take care of our common earth and you can do the right thing. And by the way, as you know, our students are demanding it now. Yeah, um, yeah. They really are vocal. Um, and you may have seen early, I remember a year ago, I had Jack and I were talking and I said, you know, we should try to get ahead of the curve. And we talked about this notion of, should we think about divesting of fossil fuels in our endowment, which is a very contentious, difficult discussion yeah. to have. Um, and he said, well, go ahead and take your time, do your research. I worked with Mike Barry, our chief investment officer. We looked at, could we do it? Would it work? And we came to the conclusion we could. In fact, just last week, he switched to a investment vehicle that looks at the market for equities, but does it without exposure to fossil fuel companies and performs mm -hmm. as well or better. So you can do it. And our board, which is a very uh, you know diverse board, decided to embrace that. It was February when they voted to approve a gradual um, removal of fossil fuels from our portfolio. It feels like 10 years ago with COVID in between. I know. But you know, it's been instructive to be a leader and Georgetown is a leader and sort of saying we we can do these things and we can balance. It's been really, really rewarding to work with an amazing team. And sometimes it's really difficult. We have students who go to the aggressive end of the scale, i.e., you know, <laughs> you've seen it. <laughs> want to you know sit in your office, uh, want to be cantankerous, but you can also make it a win-win because this same group of students were profoundly thankful that we were able to take these things into consideration to do the right thing and save money, which is, after all, a kind of a good combination. Yeah. I so agree with you. I, I, I keep on saying, Jeff, that it, this is the one issue that every every single per, every single discipline besides each generation can, at a university can get around. So faculty, but, but you know, biology, there's reasons why biologists and chemists and economics professors and moral theologians and ethicists, you know, whatever, we can really get around this because I think that they're, they're seeing, they're, they're sensing this. We just, I just heard that this past September was the warmest September on record. Uh, it's, you know, so I mean, there is a sense that things are changing and how do we do it? And so students are, they're revved up. They're very much revved up. and. Uh, it's 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 great to see things happening in, in that regard. Um, I didn't know about that that you got that uh, the, the the solar. That's great. Yeah. The other thing we're building our first dorm downtown. I don't know if everyone who's listening knows that, but we're we're building a dorm on H Street. If any of you know Gonzaga High School, it's it's right its face abutting the football field there, and we've leased that land from Gonzaga on, on a long term basis, and we just broke ground on a dorm and. Our goal is to have undergraduates downtown who want to kind of have experiential learning around public policy so they can do some time on the hilltop and some time downtown. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about this as an environmentally friendly dorm. So it'll be solar heated for the water. It'll have photovoltaic panels for the electricity. But we're also going to put an urban garden in the back and ask the students help take care of it and grow some of the food they eat. And we're going to have we, we're working on technology where they'll control the building together. So they'll they'll have on their phone exactly what they're consuming and what choices they can make. And I, I kind of think that's an example of our what we do here, right? How we can both teach and engage um, right. folks on on these common problems. Yeah, and 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 Jeff, you're you know you're uh, we're also kind of united with uh, we have now a Laudato Si chair in biology, so we have a scientist who's doing some of the statistics, and we're going to be having another uh, Jesuit actually, who I think you know, um, Gael Giroux. Uh, yeah. Who's going to be doing the kind of the economic kind of the, uh, policy side of of this as well? Um, so I think again, having someone like you in your position and having these uh, um, these academic high-powered academic positions, 
Um, I think Georgetown really will, it's, it's already a leader, but it's gonna continue to be a leader, especially on, on policy, I think. That's cool. Um, is there another, of all those different values that we hear about community and diversity, career personalis, um, obviously academic excellence. I don't need, we don't need to talk about that. I'm looking at my little sheet here because I was a, a, a faith that does justice. Is there another value from that that just seems to have been a, kind of threaded through who you, who you are and wh what you've become? Uh, I'm sort of, I, I hate to even say the word because it doesn't, it, it, it's tough. It's a tough word, but it's, humility is an important word too. It's often easy to get caught up in self <laughs> um, yeah. and and looking at why you choose to do the things you do and and um, I will tell you when I look back at my eight years at Ohio State I, I will the two things I'm most proud of may surprise you the first is we did some uh, phenomenal work with a great team and we we're able to enlarge, uh, enlarge our endowment in addition to the philanthropic work we did and one of the choices we made as a leadership team was to make make it so that no Pell eligible student would ever have to pay tuition again um and that 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 would and there's no name on it there's no big proclamation just quietly done and then the other one is that actually one of my colleagues here Lori Baldwin who joined me from Ohio State who now runs our facilities group came to see me right about right after I got to Ohio State and said you know Jesse Owens went to Ohio State and in 75 years ago, he was at the Olympics in Berlin, uh, where he, you know, right. won everything. And there's no statue of Jesse on our campus. And I thought that just can't be. So I went to the president and said, "I just I'm appalled, and we need to do something." And again, he said, "Well, okay, go do it. You have six months. You got to convince the faculty. You got to raise two and a half million dollars. You got to find an art artist. You got to commission it, and then you got to figure out how to have an event ready to go." Yeah. I of course had no idea what any of that meant because I just got there. So I said, okay. <laughs> so so we did. Lori and I set up a team. We brought in students. We brought in uh, academics. And fast forward, we raised more than that. We had this amazing event where Jesse's daughters came uh, and uh, and some others uh, who who had written a book about his um, his experiences. And we had a statue built of him up on a podium, holding his medals, right outside the Jesse Owens track. And again, there's no name anywhere of who did it or anything like that. But when you, my daughter's a track was a track runner in high school, and when we'd go to the state meets, the kids would be up there taking their picture with that right. statue, right? And so, again, accomplishing things that aren't about yourself but are about helping others and helping yeah. right wrongs is no bad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah wonderful. You know, before we invite others uh, into for the from the chat, um, you know, you mentioned the fact that you know you've been you've, well, you've been you've been you've done a lot, uh, Jeff, and you've done you've done work at a, a, a secular college, a, a state college, and you've done and now at Georgetown, you're back at your alma mater now, um, reconnecting in so many ways. Um, what do you are there? What's the what's the difference you see? I mean, you've been here now three. This is your third year. Um, what are some of the differences that you see even just between those two different institutions, you know, um, or perhaps what you see coming back to Georgetown now as a fully grown man, looking at students who are like, oh, I was there, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, something like that. Does that make sense? It does. So they're very different schools in the sense that one has 63,000 students, you yeah. know, um, and and the other, and it's public and so you know the idea of having an interview with a with a priest <laughs> would not have happened at Ohio State as an official thing, right? Which in some ways is sad because there is activity, but it's always on the periphery in terms of spiritual enrichment. Um, but but uh, different kids, all super smart, but different backgrounds, different missions, um, and yet there are similarities. We're both on the big stage in in athletics. We, mm -hmm. we won the national championship last year in soccer. I asked Jack if he wanted to swap rings because I had one from the football championship <laughs> when I was a Buckeye. He said, no, I don't blame him. I think so proud of our soccer team. But things like that are similar. We're both doing research. Um, we have a, we have an, if I, I couldn't believe it's possible, but we have an even smarter student body than what I saw at Ohio State just because it's so selective and it's such a small class. Yeah. Um, but we also, much to my surprise, 
have an often mark a more contentious campus because we in, we encourage people to speak freely and engage in discourse and challenge here in a way that I didn't see as much at Ohio State. So right. so I, I I see that playing out itself every day with different groups of students and faculty in a in a different way. Uh, it's not a good way or a bad way. It's just a different way. No, of but, but you're right, Jeff. I mean this. I mean we're on the heart of the of the nation's political discourse right here at Georgetown. We have a school of foreign service. We think of of public service as kind of a uh, a, a kind of a birthright of a, of a Georgetown graduate uh, uh, education. And there is a kind of an activist kind of feel about it. And our students are really there. I have to say coming, I, I'm, I'm here just like I said, a year af, uh, before you. And that was also a big change for me coming from Loyola Chicago here. There was just a sense that students were wicked smart. I mean, wicked smart. And secondly, they really had a sense of um, that I'm gonna use my time here to, to to hone not only hone my skills, but to cause to, to stir up the kind of the conversation. So there's there's a lot of stirred up conversation here, which I think is a very valuable thing. And I hope that it's part of the journey that Georgetown is. It's different, I think, than 20 years ago. I was talking to an alum from the 90s and said, "We well, weren't that activists in the 90s, you know." And I said, "Well, you know, it's just no. it's, it's a different it's a different era." I, I said, "You were in the 60s." I think Jack was either the like dean of students or either after I left, or I I of course I say of course I never was in that office thankfully but but I was pretty activist about apartheid I remember I mean I think things come and go I think basketball was a bigger deal but I remember being pretty active at the south of African embassy and things and um mm -hmm. so to your point kind of encouraging it here but it seems like it's turbocharged lately uh, yeah, least, yeah that's been my experience but what well, these are great kids and I you know, we were having a discussion last night, and I think the thing I'm learning is you have to meet them where they are, and you know that better than I because you work yeah. with so many right. of them. And so I have dinners, I host different. I, now I had to do it outside last time with masks on, and um, mm -hmm. but but understanding where where their journey is coming from and seeing how we can help and understanding what some of the challenges are um, is important. I mean, the big change since when I was here, of course, is social media. You know, when yeah. I studied abroad, <laughs> I laughed. My dad, a super cheap doc who let me rent the Winnebago, would have me call home once a month and collect, and he would not accept the charges because he knew I was alive. You know, now <laughs> nowadays, kids have devices 24-7, right? They're connected all the time. And I think we're starting to see some of the impacts of that change social media, the way, you know, the way they interact. And it's I think it's kind of profound. Yeah, there's more and more research, Jeff, that just suggests that there's a lot more anxiety and depression in our students. I mean, there's there's a there's so much great um, hunger for for change and a hunger for kind of connection. But you're right. At the same time, there's so many piece, uh, uh, media almost bullets that come to them uh, and, and are shooting at them at the time. Yeah. Um, so we just have I I think we have enough time uh, to ask some have some questions from the group. This has really been uh, good though. It's been fun to have this kind of conversation. Let me just share one thing, by the way, before we do that about COVID, we haven't talked about, but and the the strength of the Georgetown family has been profound. So a lot of my classmates, if you're here, Jim Farley, who's now the CEO of Ford. Uh, was incredibly helpful hooking up with, with up us up with his team to learn how to reopen. They were ahead of us. You know, Ford has dormitories in China, factories everywhere. Bill McMahon, who was a year ahead of me, is a senior executive at Thermo Fisher. And what I found, and that's the equipment we're using to develop testing. Um, turns out he and I were at Jeff and Jane's wedding 30 years ago because he and Jane were good friends in New South. And you just the connectivity and the desire to help is unbelievable amongst yeah. our alums, you know, and every day I turn over a new leaf of people who want to help help us and help the, the institution they love. So I, I just wanted to mention that, Mark, because that is something that I think is uniquely Georgetown. I'm sure it happens at lots of institutions, but just watching it unfold has yeah. been amazing. Well, I have to say, Jeff, I totally agree. I've gone around the country before COVID to, to talk to alumni and I'm 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 impressed with the the bonds, the commitment, the commitment to each other, but the commitment to the university. Uh, the alum here are of a different breed. There's there's no doubt about it, um, and and it's really been it's been wonderful. And, and actually doing these things is a way just for us to kind of connect with the alum around, alumni around the, the country and around the world. 
as well. So I appreciate you saying that. And I do appreciate uh, all that you guys are doing for us um, through this uh, pandemic. It's not easy. And um, and I know there's been some really rough times and some really uh, f lots of fatigue around it. But um, I'm really impressed with Cura Personalis uh, happening uh, in this. And you know, you were talking about meeting kids where they are. I think in some ways that is the way I would define what Cura Personalis is. I care for the person from where they are, and I start there before we, we go on a journey together. And sometimes we don't do that in life because we we're busy and we just say, this is what has to happen, or this is what I think of you, so that's how I'm gonna start. But just listening and being there, I think it's, it's a really good uh, way of thinking about Cura Personalis. What's their context? Um, I think, Kelly, do we have a, a question or two? I, I can always ask more questions, but I want to make sure some of the alums have those. We do, Father Bosco, and I've um, I've directed them right to uh, your chat, if you... I don't know, if because I'm in a different way of doing this, I'm not sure if I can see them now. Got it, okay. So you're um, going to have to do that. <laughs> sure, no worries. Uh, so one one really great question, Jeff. The principle, the Jesuit principle of casuistry, which I understand is using particular circumstances to develop decision-making rules and apply them to new circumstances. Side note, Father Mark, I hope that's about right. Seems like it might be useful in running a university. Is it something you use, and if so, how does it help? Wow, that's great. That is a great question. I, look, one of the things I learned very quickly, you have to be a special soul to work in higher ed on a good day to start with. And it's not for most business leaders because it is not a command and control environment. And you cannot just walk in and say, okay, tomorrow we're changing the healthcare benefits. You you have to engage and be curious. And I think it, it's really important to try to solicit um, input. And, and, and it's also incredibly frustrating, to be honest with you. Yeah. But because you know there are things that we say, my gosh, we've got to get going. But but I do think that that is right. That that this sense of inquiry and engagement is critical to success um, because you have so many smart people around you, um, and you know there we have people with very different roles and jobs that you have to bring into the tent. And I will tell you, you know, some of these proud Georgetown moments. So one of the things that I working with President DeJoya, looking at the numbers with my team when COVID hit and saying, oh my gosh, I think I used the phrase to so many people on my tours around campus, this may be some of our darkest hours since the Civil War, which is a kind of a profound thing to say. But at one point we thought we were gonna lose well in excess of $100 million. We had no idea what fall enrollment would look like. Uh, and Jack asked me and others to work with all of these constituencies to see if we could come together come together to to not to to agree we would not have a merit increase and that we would not have retirement uh, contributions for a year and then our senior leaders banded together and voluntarily re reduced our salaries by about three million dollars and then our board joined in and you know so it's this a sense of engaging and working together to kind of hit a common goal is something I think unique to higher ed and I actually think unique to Georgetown and the way we approach it here and it's it's allowed us to to weather this storm together yeah and i think i think what what you've modeled jeff in the during all of this is a kind of um uh, it's really a discernment it's a discerning it's a, it, to do to do what uh the the person who asked the question to do that kind of jesuit casuistry it's a discerning process that means i i i might know what i think is the best decision but i really have to not only get experts but we have to kind of all be in this together uh, to see what is apostolically possible, to use a, a Jesuit word, what's what's really good for the mission, and um, and, I, and I've been I've, I've appreciated the fact that we've been trying always to make sure we uh, we really cast the net wide in conversation and consultation um, to keep people with with jobs, uh, to keep people safe. So that's 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 excellent. You know, I will share two things for everyone. Number one, I, I, I and Mark was very helpful. So I, I host a video conference for any staff who wants to join in every two weeks uh, since the, the crisis began. And on an average week, we'll have about 1,500 of our colleagues join in this call. And I think a lot of it is angst, huge angst. And Mark I, uh, graciously agreed to join fairly early and to, to offer a little meditation and a little calm. 
um, just to help people get through yeah. this period. And, and it's still robust when we meet and people are still nervous, uh, even though we have not had to do any significant furloughs like other schools. In fact, we've developed something that was an idea Jack had, which is called Redeploy Georgetown where we've looked at folks who are underemployed in their area you know yates isn't open as an example right now so a lot of the folks who work at yates rather than furloughing them we asked them to help out with some new needs we had so as we returned to campus we needed ambassadors and badge checkers and look people looking at tracing and tracking and so we have 122 mm -hmm. um fellow hoya employees that we've been able to redeploy into new jobs and and so i think i do think this kind of curiosity as a community and is willing to engage together has been helpful but it's also been very fearful for people mark you hear it a lot i mean i think it's across the country and one of the things we didn't know with our students and we immediately reacted was will there be families who can't afford to come next year yeah uh, and and so we as an example we we waived the requirement for summer jobs if you were on financial aid to make a contribution because a lot of kids couldn't get jobs yeah. Uh, and we stood ready to help these kids, right? So I'm very proud of how we are able to manage all these things together and kind of keep it all together, which is a real team effort. Yeah, excellent. Do we have time? We have time for another question, um, right, Kelly? Yes, we do. Um, so here's one, Jeff, from John Alario. Uh, great to see a fellow 85 alum doing great work at GU. I'm interested for you to elaborate a bit more on Georgetown's renewable energy sourcing. Are you hoping to build a similar partnership um, to the one that you created under the Ohio State Energy Partners? Oh, that's a good question. So, so, so there are two things there. One, um, we did make a commitment to get to all uh, renewable energy and we're now two-thirds of the way there and so we'll continue that work I'd like to see some of it on our campuses like the new building solar panels and such um, but the other commitment that this institution has made is to really get to total carbon neutrality uh, in the future which will which those of you have you know we have an old campus and we have challenges and significant investments to make and so we are trying to say what what is the best way to approach this what john is referring to at ohio state we actually did a partnership with a a, a, a french company called angie who's also committed to carbon neutrality to have them work with us to manage the utility and to help make the investments in the sustainability so we could meet our goals water neutrality um so yeah we're looking at that we're also looking at uh, some of the things i've learned i had no idea we've got to look at redoing Healy Lawn at some point in Copley Lawn, not only because Copley Lawn becomes a duck pond every time it rains, but also because the, the soil is so compacted after a couple hundred years that we're losing three million plus gallons of water a year due to runoff. And so it gives us a chance to kind of re-envisage what the lawn can look like. And so we're looking at a lot of projects and a lot of potential opportunities to meet this goal uh, in the coming decade. Excellent. Let's do one more and then uh, and, and then we'll do our closing. Okay, if you don't mind, I have one quick one, I think, Jeff, okay. and then do another one okay. after that. Um, okay. So we do have one guest who's asked, I would love to read or learn more about the project you mentioned regarding students taking care of a communal garden and focusing on policy. Can you share the name of that initiative or effort? So Pete Mara has joined us about a year ago to lead our, our global environment initiative. And he and I have been working on a intersection of academic and reality, i.e. sustainability as uh, on the campus and, and environmental science as an academic pursuit. And it was actually his idea. So I will give all credit to Pete. Um, and you mentioned Gael. When we met Gael, he and I, Pete and I met with Gael in Dublin with Provost Groves. And one of his colleagues came from a South African university that was doing a rural garden version of this. And Pete got fired up and I got fired up with him to say, well, why can't we do this in an urban setting? So we don't have a name yet, but we're all ears if anyone wants to learn more. So we will probably be <clears throat> sharing more on this in the coming months. The, the dorm will be done in about a year and a half. And so uh, we'll have more to share, but the notion is getting the students engaged in the production downtown um, of some of the food they eat and then hopefully working with the homeless as well um, engaged in this and 
Um, but the specifics are gonna be coming. He wants to have one of the gardens on campus. So we're trying to figure out the ideal location for that as well. So we'll probably have a, a series of these to engage our community. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Peter's a great guy. I, I mean, he's great. he'll be a great partner in all this. Peter Mara, our, our Laudato Seed Chair, uh, just came, I think, from the, net. was it National Geographic? I forgot. He came from the Smithsonian, and many of you may have read his article in the New York Times about the fact there are billions less birds in the world today yeah. than there were a few years ago. He he wrote that. <clears throat> yeah. Kelly, was that it, or was, did you say there was one sh another oh. short one? One last question, okay. I think, for, for both of you, actually. Uh, with all that's going on in the world today, what advice do you have for today's students? Jeff? You want me to start? Look, I, I reflect on this, and it's a real challenge. These, these young folks who are here, if you guys think about it, were born under the shadow of 9-11. They lived through the Lehman crisis in 2008, and just as they were finishing high school, COVID hit. And so they didn't finish high school and now they're starting college. So keep the faith, you know, try to stay engaged and connected. I, my biggest worry in all this is the mental health, not just of the students, but of everybody and making sure, by the way, I teach as well, just because I can't give it up and, you know, trying to teach online and understand what the students are feeling. And this is often their only touch point right now with folks at the university is their professor. And so my advice is take advantage for them of what they have and keep the faith and, and know that we're, work, we're all working on um, making sure that we can do everything we can to get it back to as close to normal as possible. Because what makes Georgetown great is the classes, yes, but it's the community and the connectivity and the other things we learn to do together while we're here and the friends we make. So keeping that faith that this will work out and we'll be able to get back to it is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say everything that Jeff said of it, and maybe just add, uh, as the as the as the Jesuit mission and ministry VP, you know, find that find a spiritual place of quiet, find a place where you can renew yourself and say, you know what, uh, this is I, I give my gifts and my talents to whatever I have in front of me, but in the end, I'm just a human person loved by God. Uh, in the midst of a of a broken world. Um, so the hope is in the fact that I'm loved by God and by other people who love me into life. But at the same time, I think you, you see these students and you say, listen, the world is broken. It was broken in our time when we were your age. It may be a little more broken now with COVID, but um, it doesn't, you know, have hope uh, as Jeff said, uh, and make sure you, sp you spend that time to re-energize re yourself in the spirit, in your body, uh, with friends, um, with laughter, with joy. So uh, that's, that's, I think that's what I would say. Jeff, this has really been a, a real treat for me. I know it's been a treat for the alumni as well to, uh, to have you, uh, just to talk and chat. You have so much on your plate that you could take the time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we'll have to do it again sometime. We'll, we'll have to do it again, to you and I. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very soon, Thank you, Mario. It's been a treat for um, me and too. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thanks. All right. Well, listen, everyone, we're going to be continuing conversations with Father Bosco. Uh, and our next uh, one is coming up in just a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking with um, our imam uh, here, Yaya Hendi. We'll have other people such as Todd Olson coming up. Well, the, we just have, a, we're kind of really trying to, so who are these leaders uh, at Georgetown? How are they connected to us? And how do, the, uh, how do alumni need to know uh, what they need to know about uh, the, the, the great group and community that we have here uh, at this university. So signing off today, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mary Brzezinski. Thank you, everybody at the Alumni uh, Relations and Association. We really appreciate your time. Bye now. Thank you.